It is a beautiful day in Chicago, and we are at the 2016 ASH meeting on hematologic malignancies. In an era of novel targeted therapies, we're seeing a change definition of high-risk chronic lymphocytic leukemia. So let's spend just a little bit of time on how I treat CLL, high-risk genetics. And to do so, I'm with Dr. Jennifer R. Brown, who is an MD and a PhD, and the director of the Chronic Lymphocytic Leukemia Center at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, and an associate professor of medicine at Harvard there. Now, your clinical translational research program in CLL at the Dana-Farber has a particular focus on novel therapeutics and genomics, so you're probably the, the best person here to talk about this. How has what we think of as high-risk chronic CLL changed in recent years? Hmm. So we used to consider that multiple high-risk chromosome abnormalities, both, for example, loss of the short arm of 17, 17 P deletion, and loss of the long arm of 11 Q, potentially even trisomy 12, were on the higher risk side. I, now, I think with the advent of abrutinib and its ilk, we're seeing that the 11 Q, trisomy 12 are not so high risk really at all almost. 17P is still high risk associated with somewhat earlier relapse, but we're also achieving greater nuance to that. For example, it appears that 17P deletion with a complex karyotype is significantly higher risk than without a complex karyotype. It's also the case that we have always historically considered the approximately half of CLL patients with an unmutated immunoglobulin heavy chain gene, so-called unmutated IGHV, to be high risk. And those patients without 17P deletion or now don't really seem to be so high risk. They're having prolonged remissions in the setting of our novel agents. And so that's very exciting. So what does this mean in terms of influencing decisions regarding treatment? So the 17P patients still need to be considered separately and we treat them with novel agents initially, abrutinib basically frontline, and then venetoclax is approved in the relapse setting for those patients. I think we need a better understanding of what modifies the risk in 17P patients to even triage the highest risk patients, for example, to transplant while others can stay on the novel therapy indefinitely. In practice, we used to worry very much about a patient who had chemoimmunotherapy and relapsed two years later even though they didn't have 17P deletion, but they probably had unmutated disease. Now that patient can go on a brutinib or a delicib or a combination thereof and expect to have a significantly longer remission than they had from that prior chemoimmunotherapy. We don't actually even know how long yet <laughs> that remission might last. And so those patients are of much less short-term concern in terms of their outcome than they used to be. So I would imagine that the whole area of uh, stem cell transplantation has changed too in recent years because of these new options. Right. It used to be that we would struggle getting the very high risk relapsed refractory patients to a transplant because we couldn't get them in a deep enough remission. And then for a few years we've been getting them on a brutinib and a and venetoclax and they've been doing very well. Now we're seeing the emergence of patients relapsing on the BCR inhibitors like a brutinib, and that is still a challenging situation. That has become a new aspect of high-risk disease in CLL that we still don't completely know how to optimally manage, and I think those are the patients in particular in whom we now focus for stem cell transplantation. But it's a much smaller group of patients. Right, it is. Now, given your research, what's likely to change in the next few years? What are we likely to see that will further change how you treat this particular set of patients? So I'm very excited about generating combinations of novel agents. We know that with single agent abrutinib, there's ongoing clonal evolution and patients will relapse. Whereas if we can combine abrutinib with, for example, venetoclax, which have synergistic potential clinical activity as well as in vitro biologic activity, hopefully we can reduce the development of resistance and then we can have even the highest risk patients stay on these oral drugs potentially indefinitely. So are you really encouraged at this point? It's very exciting times in CLL with these new drugs. And I, I feel like we're still in an intermediate period for these high risk people because to get to, it feels like we could be on the cusp of getting toward cure. But we're not doing that with the single agents. So that's why I'm very interested in starting to get combinations into trial and potentially moving toward that cure. Well, thank you very much, because I love the whole concept of this meeting where they're doing more, many more of these how I treat sessions. And I thought this was a particularly good one in, in, for a number of different reasons, but particularly because you were able to take a little time for, uh, for us. And I really appreciate that. For uh, Ash Clinical News, we have a variety of uh, reports that will be in print as well as here online. And for American Medical Communications, I'm an executive editor, Rick McGuire.